Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Ramen Bros Podcast, where we're your hosts, Bobby and Eric. And we're here today to talk about some real, authentic male emotions now. I said that with a lot of pizzazz because I'm feeling the energy. Uh, I'm really excited for today's conversation. Um, this is somebody I've kind of worked with before, and I'm like super stoked. At, and we have a lot, we just have a lot in common. So I think it's going to be super fun. So, uh, Eric, how are you feeling today? I'm feeling good. Uh, you know, I'm also going to Korea uh, in a couple of days, which uh, is going back to the motherland. I haven't been there in a while. And so pretty excited about that. Um, it is a work trip. So, you know, obviously won't have too much free time, but, you know, it'd be good to see uh, my mom who's there and uh, yeah, spend some quality time and uh, probably just a bunch of Korean barbecue. So um, it'll be good overall. Uh, but to kind of kick us off, uh, I wanted to introduce you, Christian. I mean, obviously, we've known each other for a long time, uh, or feels like feels like forever. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll formally introduce five you. years, <laughs> five years. Um, but it's been longer than me, right? Uh, it, it feels like it's, it's been a long time, and so you know, I was kind of looking at wow, like we we've been through a lot here, and uh, you're originally from New Jersey. Uh, which is where I'm originally from. Uh, you went to school at Penn and also in Columbia, which is where I met you in New York City uh, when we uh, started up Waves. All right, a little, little more formal introduction. You did your master's thesis at Columbia on the depiction of depression on uh, video in video games and then the efficacy in promoting empathy, uh, you're also the chief of strategy at AMHC, which is the Asian Mental Health Collective um, and the nonprofit. Uh, so doing some awesome work there. Um, you're also at Apple as a project manager. And like I said before, we met each other through Waves uh, and you're also a really good friend of ours. And so we're excited to have you. Welcome to the podcast. Ooh, yeah, um, I met Christian too. So we have a relationship too. I think it was funny. I used one of the... the I use Subtle Asian Mental Health, the Facebook group under AMHC, saw there's a newsletter, I signed up, and then at the very bottom of the newsletter, there was Christian's face. At the time, you were, I think, chief of data. I was like, what the heck? How do you how do, you do data and mental health? I am fascinated. So I, I reached out, and basically the rest is history. So um, yeah, During our early stages, I went through like five different titles in like two weeks. It's like Madonna right there. <laughs> Changing it up left and right. I forgot that was one of the titles. I was like, I had no clue. I, had no, I still don't know what I do in the group, but all I know is it's a, it's a, it's a good group and I'm glad to get get things done and the intangible change in the world. But yeah. <laughs> I think, Most yeah, important. Data at some point. <laughs> <laughs> Just get the job done. Uh, and obviously, um, yeah. And so we're, we're obviously excited to, to have conversations. Like we, I think personally have had a lot of conversations around mental health and all of the, the ups and downs and the fun things that can come with life. Right. And so um, let, let's kick it off with just getting to know more about you, uh, more about your story and um, yeah. Who is Christian and like, what, what was it like growing up for you? <laughs> Oh boy, that's a loaded question based off my last week of therapy. But all right, let's let's dive in. Um, yeah, no. So, um, Christian Deluna, Alexander Deluna, uh, from Oradell, New Jersey. So, um, been there, um, in the Northeast for the first thirty years of my life. Uh, born in New York. Parents come from the Philippines. Moved over here in the eighties. Um, I have an older sister who is uh, one year and a half older than me um but yeah uh, so it's been uh and they're visiting her and her husband and my niece are visiting uh, so it's been cool to see family out here because it's been a stretch uh but yeah i'd say like who am i as far as like upbringing go and like just in terms of yeah growing up there's just, there are a lot of ways i can take this one so we'll just we'll see where it flows naturally how I attribute my identity. The first thing that comes to mind is probably um, actually athletics and video games or like games in general are the first things that come to mind. So it's like I was a big gamer growing up and also I was a pretty big athlete. Um, so those have been very big 
hallmarks of my like personal I- identity. Um, that's why I did my master's thesis looking at games-based learning um, and how to promote um, awareness, empathy for mental health disorders uh, through games. Um, but yeah, that's definitely we can something we can dive into. But yeah, it's just been something that's really been um, ingrained with me to just like identity wise. Um, but yeah, as far as um, my mental health journey goes, um, I'd say so. For one, um, uh, growing up around the age of uh, middle school age, my mom de- developed major depressive disorder. Um, so as a young child who didn't know anything that was going on, it was really confusing because like she would be just like distraught all the time, crying, unable to like just she had to leave her job on long term full time disability. And like me and my sister were just unused to it and did not know what the hell was going on. Um, yeah, after that, it's uh, one of those things, which, which that definitely had a big influence on kind of like how I see myself today in terms of like needs, whatnot. But again, that's other stuff that's deeper down the funnel. Um, but yeah, so then as far as that goes, so once I got into, let's say high school, I think the big triggering moment for at least recognizing um, a different order of mental health consideration needed for me was um, I remember like I was a, like always a pretty good student like I definitely um, got by pretty well enough to like be pretty high in my class and all that stuff um, but yeah I think my going into my ju- no near the end of my junior year um I got the first B I've ever gotten in a semester so um not for the semester not for the I don't know except quarter I don't know what we did in high school but yeah so like for the final grade and I was just like beside myself for, like because and I don't even know why like my parents like in typical like Asian parent fashion they like they weren't like that stereotypical like tiger parent kind of thing my parents were pretty laid back so it was all for me I'm sure somewhere else too but and I know some of the sources of it but yeah so they had to call in my parents Um, I was taken to the guidance counselor and they knew kind of something was up and my mom was already like pretty like it looks like five six years down like being fully disabled um, and unable to engage so it was one of those things where they recognize at least like yeah he probably has a mental health disorder it's not just like uh, changes in mood um, which is helpful because at least started help giving me you know, like a thought and a name to some of the things going on. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where I at least first had my realizations and like first awareness that um, things are different for my family, um, being a caregiver of, in mental health situation, but also for myself as someone who has a, a mental health diagnosis, uh, mental health illness. Yeah. Yeah, dude, thanks for sharing that. Um, I can relate a little bit. I mean, I definitely cried the first time I got... Well, I, I cried when I got like a B in French after trying so hard. And um, as silly as it was back then. Uh, there's definitely something along the lines of just performance and being very performative. I similarly didn't have super tiger parents. However, I knew that I had... I had need to be very self-critical and, and hard on myself to be able to produce to do my best to move forward in life can you talk to a little bit about how you were processing that performance that be and what kind of went through your head and what were your values that maybe made you feel what you felt yeah i can give you a then perspective and then a now perspective 30 years later, 20 years later on it um the then perspective was Honestly, it's just very confused. Um, I think a lot of it was I felt like I was trying, but for some reason I just couldn't make the grade. Um, and there was just like I don't even know who I felt like I was disappointing, apart from myself. But um, yeah, so it was oh, it was just such a weird question mark. Like, who am I like, so trying to perform for? Who am I trying to impress with this? And all I know is it just made me feel bad about myself, that I'm a bad person for not doing well at this. 
and that's a reason to be upset about it. So I like, and that's where I can give, give you like the 20 year version after going through copious amounts of therapy and psychoanalysis and whatnot. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, a big part of it was just kind of like the, like one of the things I'm going through in therapy right now, and like the reason I've um, taken um, just some time off from work is to process through a lot of difficulties I have with acceptance of self. Um, I think it's one of those things like growing up kind of related to my uh, situation with my parents. Like it was one of those things where I like love and care for my parents a lot, but they just couldn't really have, they didn't have as much capacity to actually care for me because like me and my sister, because my mom was completely disabled and then my dad had to basically take care of her full time. So that just left me and my sister to fend for ourselves and do whatever is needed to survive and also do what was needed to get attention. Um, it was just one of those things where as a child, you can't process like, oh, why aren't they taking care of us? Like, why, what, what's wrong with mom? Why is she crying all the time? So it shifts all of like the attention off of you where you think like, oh, I guess I'm not supposed to get the attention. So let me just do my own thing, focus on myself. Um, so then, yeah, that kind of let down a spiral of just thinking like, oh yeah, I'm not someone who's worthy of care, which kind of really developed up for, and this goes back to like what we were talking about earlier, my, my difficulties with self-care. It's very hard for me to practice self-care because I inherently just don't believe I'm worthy of it. And that's a big thing I'm going through right now. I but, feel you. I feel you on so many different levels. Yeah. I hearing like survivalism, um, mm. you're, you're there to fend for yourself. And then there is like, Hey, I did a bad thing. Hence I'm a bad person in some sense. I think of the, mm -hmm. so remember in the movie up the, the dog, mm -hmm. the, what hurts him the yeah. most is when he, he hears that he's a bad dog, that he's inherently a bad, uh, person. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Oh, God. Yes. <laughs> I, I wrestle with that. I wrestle with that too. Uh, I personally have a performative nature that kind of de depicts how I grade myself and then that's how I'm going to treat myself. So and I, I think I can relate because I'm just, just trying to move forward in life. So yeah, um, dude, thanks for sharing that. I don't have any like crazy questions, but I just, I just want to like honor the gravity of that. I, I understand that, that takes a lot of time and therapy to process to connect the dots but i think you've done a wonderful job um making sense of everything so kudos yeah, to that it's, it's, it's like that's the thing with therapy i appreciate you saying that bob because like i like, think giving myself that recognition too comes super hard and like it always helps in some sense of it i'm getting there but yeah like it's the work you put in like there are times when it just feels like like because even with this like i was talking about therapist and like this feels like an ingrained identity like the fact that i'm asian and filipino how do I ever change that? That just seems immutable. Like I was telling her, it's like in scientific parlance, like there are theories and there are laws. Theories can be tested, treated around, maybe like disproven. Laws are immutable. That's what they are. And that's, it's one of those things. Like when people say like, oh, wow, you're like really accomplished and do amazing things. Like I'll always defer it just because deep down there's a core instinct that like, no, you're not. <laughs> and that's like such a hard, like, space to grapple with but i know like everyone has that internalized in some capacities like there's just there's just someone like everyone hates themselves in some capacity but i also learned in converse that everyone loves themselves in some capacity so like that's that was like a big breakthrough i had last like monday actually with my therapist just thinking like yeah you know if somebody like i don't know if you like there has to be the other side of it too like the reason why i'm still here i mean if anything like that's one of the things like and i know it's been family and friends of you guys have uh, gotten me through along the years. So I always have that uh, gratitude, but yeah, no, it's, it's a journey. And I think again, going back to what you said, about, uh, Bobby, I really appreciate the, the validation for kind of like that, the work it takes in that journey. Cause I know we don't give ourselves enough credit a lot of the times too. So. Yeah. And obviously we support you, um, you know, as a friend, as, as a brother, as a, as a, as someone that I've seen, obviously going through that journey together, um, the ups and downs, uh, it's not easy, like you said. Uh, and sometimes it feels like we're, we're pretty low, right? And 
um, just acknowledging that, hey, like it's hard uh, and that we, 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 we go through those seasons, uh, I think there's still power in that. Uh, and practicing kindness, uh, I think that's something that we, we owe it to ourselves to, to be kind to ourselves. Yeah. Someone once told me like, life is like waves. They just like ebb and flow. And sometimes they just get <laughs> rocky. Such, such wise words. <laughs> I don't know if I'm pointing at him. Or he's above me in my screen. So. <laughs> but yeah, so that was definitely a big part of that mental health journey too. So <laughs> but yeah. No, and, and, uh, and I think that's, that's how we can relate and just connect immediately because uh you know we're, we're not afraid to go to the deep right so um and i think that's uh also the reason why you know this conversation is is so important i'm sure a lot of people will relate to this um because, you know going, going back to the the self-care aspect of things um as someone who's been in therapy and i can obviously share my personal experience of having gone through therapy and um, trying to define what self-care means to me, you know, it, it looks different for everybody. Um, and I know we were talking about this a little bit earlier, but like, what does that look for you currently in this season of life? Yeah, no, we, we were just having this convo, so it's definitely on mine. But yeah, like two of the things that instinctively always come up are like, I am just for one, like I mentioned, like an athlete my whole life. So like, exercise has been always a thing that I do, but not necessarily sure if that's a form of self-care. Um, I think the main part of it, like, so I do a lot of triathlons nowadays because I used to be a runner in high school. My knees started to give that a little bit. So I wanted to do more cross training to be able to just alleviate some of the stressors. Um, but like now that I'm like, I have a big race coming up in September, barely prepared for it. And it's one of those things where it just becomes more of like a feeling of burden and guilt for not going out and doing the workout as opposed to something of pure like enjoyment like and that's where one of the things like is it self-care like this like physical activity that's what they say like it's a good thing in self-care go run go hike but if there's like such a nuance to it it's like is this self-care or is it just kind of like like because when i'm out there it feels great the physical act of it but all of the pretense around it can be pretty pretty harsh too um and then the other one mentioned this kind of where we segued into the whole games and magic conversation, which we'll, I'm sure we'll dive into. But um, yeah, I've been a gamer um, all my life. So um, that was actually, honestly, like I did whole presentations on like how game video games actually saved my life in the sense that like it was, yeah, there were a whole presentation, but I did it at my old company. But yeah, it's just, it's, but it's one of those things too, is like, where is it something that I went to for escapism um especially like in my household where things were particularly hard growing up and not understand it's like a safe stable place and like watching tv shows too I'm a big anime person and so got my, my one piece uh, but yeah so yeah it's like those things that i like some may consider self-care like watch something you enjoy or like, like so like when my therapist asked me like what do you do for practice self-care i'm like I take a step back. I don't know, <laughs> and I think that's uh, mm. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I feel okay. So I don't know if you can relate to this, but here's like a hot take. I think so much of today's uh, vernacular is about taking a step back, just journaling, reflecting. I think what's still happening, at least for me, and I don't know if you can relate to this, Christian, or even Eric, is that you're still being productive. I think when we do self care, to do hobbies. I'm hearing that, you you know, when you're doing triathlon, because I'm a half marathon runner. So if I take time to like do running, I'm still like grading my performance of how well I ran. Mm. And there's always this belief too. It's like, unless I'm running every other day, I'm just going to get slower and slower. And unless I'm eating well, I'm, you know, going to get slower. So it's just still performative nature to that. I think, and then and, and to take a step back into a grander scheme of life and in a, in a job searching mode right now, it's kind of like, unless I am, either putting resumes out there or investing in the future, I my future is going to um, like is going to fall apart. Mm -hmm. So this is the constant, like I have to do something to, for survival. And I think part of what my self-care recently has been like knowing that the house is not going to burn down. If you take not only a week, but you know, a month or even a couple of months, even half a year off, 
and just focus on other things in life. I think nowadays it's so easy to get caught up in the race, the rat race, the hustle, the acquisition game. Um, it's I think true rest, the true self care is kind of stepping out of that like mentality, and that's hard. It's not like I can just tell you to go to do it. It's like you have to. I I I mean I I just experience. That's all I, all I'm saying, and it's very different than just like following a list of things to do. So, um, so I don't know if you feel, if you guys feel any of that. Yeah, no, I hear you on that. I mean, I, that's the main reason why I just took a leave of absence from work because like after latest project was feeling pretty, pretty bad about it, honestly. And like my manager was mentioned, like I might not like my performance in it, honestly, probably like she's like, it's not, it wasn't great. So it was just one of those things where for one, like in the midst of like, the disruptions in the tech sector i'm like oh am i on the chopping block now um but also just not used to like getting negative reinforcement from outside which also bolsters the negative reinforcement from inside i'm like see see you're not good at your job um but yeah and like the biggest thing is like i needed i need to step away from that because it's just like if i sit in there it's only going to come down you really do need those spaces to step away and just like i mean as i look into hindsight and it's like maybe you're taking a vacation or something <laughs> like an actual full like vacation and, or a staycation but still like yeah i don't know you really it's it's hard like you're saying bobby to just step back um i mean especially in a world where you feel like you need to always be doing something stepping back seems mm -hmm. like a waste of time but i mean it's probably more beneficial than anything you can really do to just get recentered, but I can definitely relate to this. And one thing that jujitsu has taught me, and, and you guys know that I, I I love martial arts and watching UFC and you know studying it and watching videos. So one one thing I I feel like I've evolved as just as a human through jujitsu is actually creating uh, a, a lifestyle around jiu-jitsu so what i mean by that is like instead of using jiu-jitsu just for that one hour because i learned so much in that one hour um and you learn how to breathe you learn how to control your anger you know how to control your power you know how to speak uh you know and 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 form boundaries um and then you also know when to give up uh in, in the sense that like hey when things are tough just step away you know when things are tough like mm. you're saying christian like it's like, okay, you're hitting your wall and there's only so much you can control in life. And, um, and so when I, when I, when I roll right in jujitsu, when I'm out there for an hour, um, sometimes there'll be guys that are much better than me that are more experienced. Um, doesn't mean they're stronger, but what happens is that, uh, if I get too, uh, you know, uh, if I if I lose track of my movements or whatever, then uh, I have to tap or I have to say, hey, listen, like I'm at my end switch here and I'm going to set my boundaries like let's reset. Mm. Um, and I, I see a lot of similarities, I think, I think to 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 life. And so uh, I, I try to to bring that in hard as hell. <laughs> right. Because um, you're not in a contained environment there's a lot of other factors uh, a lot of different emotions um but i just wanted to comment that on that piece christian because you you were mentioning that you stepped away from work and it's not necessarily giving up i actually think you're setting boundaries i actually think you're in mm -hmm. the process of resetting so that you come back more engaged more filled with breath having you know more capacity in your lungs and just more capacity for life so i, yeah. I just want to validate that no, I really appreciate that. And um, okay, like this is my second time going around into like a leave of absence from work. Like back in, I think before we met, like, I think it was kind of like what led to me um, like linking up with you and having those discussions. Um, like that time around was definitely more reactive where situation got me crushed down and like I had to be basically extracted from work. Whereas this time around was a little bit more proactive on my end. And like, I think I need to step away to be more focused on it, which has some bearings on the we can definitely talk about the medical system at some point that's a whole other can of worms that i'm not 
subject matter expert to speak on, but definitely have some things to say. Um, but yeah, no, so <laughs> we'll leave that. Um, but yeah, and I think one of the things you mentioned, Eric, too, about like just the physical mental connection. It was it's a recent breakthrough I had with my um, running training too, because one of the things this year I had to basically retrain how I ran because I would not use my whole upper leg. I was very calf quad dominant, but I wouldn't use my whole like posterior chain. So like glute, um, thigh, hamstring. And like, that was what was causing severe damage to my knees. Um, so I had to neurologically just retrain that. They hooked me up to like power meters and like, so like to use and activate the muscles. Um, so from there, I was like able to figure out a way to like run differently, but on like this past Monday, when I started my like more intensive therapy, like it kind of had like a moment where I realized like, oh, like that was something I felt like was such an ingrained identity in my running. It's like, you can't change how you run. Like that's, it's just neurologically like, you know, tied, but so that kind of gave me the thought like, oh, okay, well, if that's neurologically tied, well, I can try and train my train of thoughts and try to be like reactive to because like for me it's like when I get a feeling like oh you're starting to your knees are starting to hurt you're running from your lower legs adjust move it back up but then now in my mind I'm like oh you're starting to have a negative thought about yourself adjust bring it back up it's those moments like to be able to step in and, and train yourself like, neurologically speaking I mean obviously I'm not a neurologist but like just being able to step in to try and change kind of like beliefs and habits it's a very it's a long daunting process but like there are ways I think that can go about it based off of the things that kind of resonate with you and like the physical. So, but that was an interesting point. And I think Eric that uh, kind of brought some resonance, but yeah. I want to just try to wrap this up a little bit, but I think my last lingering thought is that uh, I can relate in the, my season of life is a little bit like rewiring my initial, uh, inherent sense of worth. I think unless I'm moving forward, whether it's career or dating and things like that, I've, you know, showing people that I have worth, I feel like I haven't accomplished much and I don't deserve to be loved. I think my daily grind has been just waking up and just trying to, and knowing that if I don't do anything, anything, anything today, I think I will still be okay. People will still love me regardless. And having that inherent sense of worth. My therapist in the past asked me, like, this is the context of me getting a bunch of rejections from previous job interviews. She asked me if I was worthy to be, to be loved. And I said, no, I haven't accomplished much. And then she asked me, would you say a baby is worthy, worth to be, worthy to be loved? And I said, of course. But still like a similar like paradigm. Like we just inherently have worth and people will love you so yeah um a lot of my daily battle has been <laughs> trying to lean into that um and try to find 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 that through community and then also through myself so um speaking of community and speaking of maybe some games i'm kind of curious i think in your time <laughs> off now what is your routine what are some your hobbies and passion areas that you kind of go to to uh find healing yeah, no, to answer that plant question. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I actually had been uh, recently rejiggering some um, of my Magic Gathering decks. I've gotten some new cards, and actually, um, I got my girlfriend, Gosling, <laughs> to start playing. So it's been an interesting, like, yeah, like I tricked her into thinking, like, oh, yeah, like I just got this new deck and I need someone to play test it with. And then I was like, okay. <laughs> and then kind of got hooked into the dynamic of it but yeah so like for me it's just been very much like having these things that I've had for years and every so often revisiting and just being able to like be able to take a like I don't know this is one of the things that actually does because like I used like I'm a big video gamer too but this has always been something that's been a little bit more cathartic like there's something about the tactile touching of holding of a thing but yeah, I mean, I think what really has gotten me like engrossed recently is just kind of, it's also a revisiting. Every few years, you get a bunch of new cards and you need to like just reset how your deck works and how these things function. Like taking apart some of my decks to create, to like reestablish one deck 
two other deck ideas emerged and now I'm like, oh great, like I finished these two decks, but now I have to create a whole, like now I have to work on these other two that just came out because I'm like, oh, I have extra cards for this one now. And it's, there's a, there's a chain that just keeps going where like, I, like, I think two nights ago, I was just like sitting at my table, like putting my decks together. And before I realized it was like three or four hours had passed and I did yes. not even know. All I was doing was deck building. I feel that. Wasn't even playing. I was just like, mm. And yeah, it was wild, but it, it didn't feel, I didn't feel guilt like I did when I do, when I play video games sometimes. That's mm -hmm. a whole mm -hmm. other thing, but yeah, it's an interesting yeah, feel. To take a step back, for those of you who don't <laughs> know, uh, Magic the Gathering is this trading card game. It's a strategic card game. It's probably like, probably like the most advanced version of chess. There's a casual format to it. There is a competitive format to it. Um, there's also like some other like uh, intro newer player sort of formats as well. So the objective of the game in a 1v1 scenario is that each person has two, 20 life and you're trying to get them down to zero. And similarly in a, a multiplayer, com, you know, we call it commander, which is four, uh, four, usually four players playing in a multiplayer battle. There's 40 life gain down to zero. You have cards of resources and spells and abilities and creatures that you invest with your resources to deal that damage you can invest in different strategies of card advantage to draw more cards investing in bigger size creatures you can invest in um enchantments that have like effects that scale over a period of time through more combinations so yes i think i can relate because i've grew up playing this since 10 years old so fifth grade on and off there's nothing nostalgic about it. There's something escapism about it. There's like a fantasy art element to it. There's some critical thinking to it. And there's definitely a community aspect to it too, right? So um, I guess what about the game for you kind of hits you at the core of who you are? Yeah, at least I'd say where I started. But like it, it, was, it actually did crop up a number of different moments in my life. Like when, like when I was around like 10, 11 ish. Um, one of my best friends, like he had some magic cards, like I didn't know what they were. And like, I was just like looking through them, like, oh, these are pretty cool. Like, cause I had like Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh cards growing up too. And I like, I knew how to play and all those and I would play them too. I still enjoyed them. Um, but like, I was like, oh, these are cool too. So it was just one of those things like it had like that nostalgic link of just like, that was like before I knew how, like, and we knew how to play it a little bit. So it, there definitely was something linked to like younger, more innocent days for one. Um, going into college, me and my group of friends, like, I don't even know how or why we all started getting really into it for different reasons. And we're like, definitely a diverse group that like, half of the folks you wouldn't expect to be into magic, like, not to like stereotype the magic type, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so like, folks were interested in for like different reasons. And I think the biggest one, all in all, though, was the community aspect, because we would play we would exclusively play EDH, uh, Commander, Elder Dragon Highlander is the other name for it. So if, you're, if we throw out EDH, I still, I kind of know what that means. But um, but in any case, like we, like it was something that we would do like on weekend nights, we would just sit around and play like five player battle royale games that would take hours. And like most of our game, like we are all big on just like, none of us are big on winning. So we're big on just like building and letting see like what happens with our deck. So there were games that go like six hours and then we would just like one of our friends would just be falling asleep. And mm -hmm. then we were mm -hmm. like, you're falling asleep. We should stop playing. And then she'd be like, no, no, still play. And then just pass out again. So we're like, all right, well, it's her turn. So we can't play. Uh, so, but yeah, it's just like those memories of like playing together with people and like crazy scenarios that um, came up. But yeah, and then now, like I've just recently, um, since I've gotten Jocelyn stuck, stuck in, I've started just like <laughs> it's given me more of a reason to start playing again. Because like at least over the years, I've also been playing with my one college friend. Ever since you like introduced the spell table to me, Bobby, like I've been playing with. He's like one of my good friends on the East Coast, and that's actually how we've been staying in touch since the pandemic. So it's been like a great resource to just be able to just like keep in touch and connect over like something that we both just enjoy and talk about things too so but yeah like i think for me it definitely was and like the term that from my days in the educational gaming space uh i believe the term is affinity group so if you want to look up that one like it's just like yeah 
I mean, I think it's in a lot of spaces too, but it's like, you can like, it's like with me and Bobby, like if it's like, we started talking about it, it's like immediately asked him like, what are your colors? Cause I'm like, all right, let me, let me get a read on you. And like, so my colors I'd say are probably green, white, green, white, black. Um, uh, so, uh, Oh God, I forgot what they're called. Yeah. Uh, Abzan is the color. Yeah, Abzan, Abzan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, so, but yeah, no, it was like one of those things where it's like, there's such a personality aspect. And I think that's what's really kind of kept me in it. The fact that like you can, like the color archetypes have like very much personality traits to them. And you kind of tend to gravitate towards the personality traits that are more like you, like what you feel comfortable playing. Like for me, like I was just talking, uh, like before this, like I was talking about, like I've never built like a black red EDH deck in my life because it's just not my first step. Like red is very aggressive and also very, but sacrificial too. So, but like different types of sacrificial. So, but for me, it's like, I like, I've just never felt right playing those colors. So, but like when I built one, like, especially like there's definitely a resonance with the time I'm going in, like with a lot of suppressed anger and trying to figure that out with my workplace. So mm. it's just kind of like, well, yeah, no, so I'm going to like, and like I had one card and I was like, all right, let's try and make this. And it definitely felt like thinking through of like my views on aggression and suppression mm. too. And I don't know. So it's definitely an interesting way of, processing psyche too just kind of mm -hmm. like doing it through it, it's like story writing i mean i do that on the side too and like that's one of the things i was saying like in like i'm trying to come up with side characters for like the stories i'm writing I'm like oh yeah you know just use your commanders make them make them characters why not <laughs> and just like you have like you have their personality types you know how they function just like write around that and use that as a frame of reference so but long and short <laughs> of yeah my magic I I think okay. I so hear that. I I will say this that a lot of my exes didn't love magic, and I'm thinking about the listener that has no idea what this is. I think the best <laughs> way I can do the best thing I can do to try and like give you an analogy is that imagine four aunties sitting around a mahjong table and just playing mahjong and having a great time of community mm. and fellowship. Right. Yeah. I think that's similar here in which. Yeah. There is a weekly I I play weekly and my self-care routine is 4 hours playing Commander EDH on the weekends and it's great. And I think what's really powerful and therapeutic about that as you were kind of saying is everybody's able to express themselves in the way that, that they play. And there's kind of like this camaraderie of like we want to give everybody a chance to play and express themselves and have the fun and kind of live through that. So there is yeah. something unique about that sort of community too, as you're also highlighting that you keep in touch through the games over over the web as well, right? Even though there's physical, mm. it's a physical card game. You can play with a, a video cam and you can just use audio and play through that, which I've definitely done that in the past. Um, I've also formed a lot of really powerful big communities through this game as well in my East Coast and my West Coast communities. A lot of techies love this game. So there's a lot of tech people mm -hmm. trying to optimize and grind through the competitive scene shout out to all y'all bay area grinders um <laughs> meanwhile i'm a bay area filthy casual but i'm cool with that <laughs> that's chill that's chill i i moved away from competitive because it was so performative i, I will tell you that Ooh. i've had some highs of getting placed in like certain like tournaments but then there's also the losses which kind of sting and then i'm also going to go literally to a a small like three round mini tournament it's not even a real tournament it's like a weekly thing you can just, you can play afterwards but there's a performative element to it in which i also am aware of so i think actually in in my therapy journey my my therapist is as kind of giving me this perspective that to find true sense of healing you want to go to a place where there's non like a not not non feedback a non feedback loop mm -hmm. So I think commander edh is is a non feedback loop because it's not like win and loss it's more like, did you get to have fun and express yourself, which is a lot mm. easier to do as opposed to, did you go X and one or three and O? Mm -hmm. So, um, that's, that's a really interesting. So yeah, there's something that's yeah. really powerful about that for sure. No, that actually gives me some resonance too. With like, so me and my other friend, we play a lot of League of Legends on the mobile phone. Eric has seen us do this multiple times. We'd be hanging out with him and mutual friends, and then we would just start take out our phones, start playing Rift, and then be like. 
Are you guys still here? <laughs> but <laughs> oh, I've but, joined. Yeah, you no. Too. Oh, yeah, that's true. That, that brief moment we had you, which was a really fun top lane jacks. Uh, but yeah, no, it, yeah, it was yeah. one of those like we we made the climb to master, like me and my friend Colin, and then it's just kind of like it doesn't feel like good sometimes anymore, especially when you're like not winning and. I don't know. It's definitely a whole, there's a whole other time. Like I used to do some talks with like people at Riot, like when it's an educational game circuit, like I would do some panel events talking about like organizational leadership and psychology stuff related to um, MOBAs and multiplayer games. And like, but yeah, there was definitely something more of that performative side that you're talking about where when you're playing a ranked match, it just feels more like a chore. Whereas if you're just playing a fun, normal game, it's just like, okay, we're just hanging out, doing fun. And that's why it's always fun more like, when we're playing with a big group, it's just like, oh yeah, like we're all making memories and doing experience. Whereas like there's a stretch where Colin stopped playing and it was just me solo grinding, solo queue. And I'm like, this is awful. I hate this. <laughs> Cause it just like, like, sure I've made it, but like, what's the point? Like I can't even tell this to anyone. No one's going to care. <laughs> so, but it was a nice accomplishment, but the performative aspect of it, that's a really good point that you bring up where like, I never had thought of it that way as like a rat race in itself, but it's just like, yeah, you know, when you put that pressure on like external, internal, it's it just doesn't feel good. I mean, maybe it does for some people. I don't know, but I just can't, I can't relate to that. And I think it's just because I guess that's the external expectation everyone has that we should always be performative, but I don't know, hopefully deep down, everyone's like, no, I don't want to perform, but, and then maybe that's the first step towards destigmatizing that. And like, Hey, we don't have to be performers. Just do whatever the hell you want and enjoy life. <laughs> I don't know. You gotta pay the bills. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> gotta pay the bills. If so, so I wanted to talk about the performative side of gaming, and I can stretch to try to relate to this through jujitsu because that's the only way I know how here. Uh, um, a game. I well, not a game. <laughs> well, they they call it the human chess, and so there's um, a lot of strategy involved uh, based off of the person's strengths. Uh, their their quote unquote rolling style, but you know we figure out kind of how we want to uh, roll and what techniques we want to use, etc. So I know personally, I know that you don't like playing board games anymore because I, you know, tried to ask you and we've tried to play together, and you're like, no, I'd rather just observe. And I found that mm -hmm. very interesting. So I'd love to hear what you think about competition and what you think about gaming in terms of how that affects the person and maybe you have like mm. anecdotal experiences around that yeah i don't know if i ever followed you there was like i had a big breakthrough of that in therapy as well but um first i want to give a shout out though to eric who was an all-state golfer and bowler if i recall correctly i don't know if i'm making that up but i think you were a bowl all-state bowler is that i right? was in New Jersey? i was an all-state bowler yes so, so i mean could definitely relate to that performative of of being a ranked performer in gaming <laughs> <laughs> just refuses to share it with the world <laughs> i yeah i don't know why you just shared that but thanks. <laughs> i didn't even know this what the hell yeah it was a surprise all like, up in what? The archives there but thanks christian <laughs> no problem uh but yeah no <laughs> so as far as um yeah like so the the rake through i had was that i i am a sore winner and a poor loser I don't like seeing people lose. It makes me feel bad and it makes me feel bad thinking I'm the one who made them feel bad. And that's why, like, I'm good at games. So, like, there's a good chance I can win things. And But I always feel bad when, like, because, like, when I win, I feel bad that, like, nobody else won and they're kind of upset. Maybe they don't really care. Um, so it's like, nobody's happy when I win. But like when other people win, and that's why I like collaborative games, like, hey, we all win. So like, you're happy, I'm happy. But like, so like, I like, I always say I like a good loss over a bad win. And maybe that's a mindset I'm trying to change too. Cause like the whole, like, obviously the whole metacognitive aspect of it is like, well, you know, you need to, you need to enjoy your wins. That's why like work life has been sucking. Cause like I haven't been really enjoying any wins and I've only been fixating on the, the losses. And that's like, a big aspect of it like just that i have a very big zero sum game winners losers mentality towards things and that kind of makes it hard to just be the shades of gray and be able to just 
not ha- thinks things so bleak like you can only win or lose like in that again that performative aspect of like like there's no improving in the middle grades it's like if you're not doing well then you're doing poorly and that's definitely what keeps me away from doing a lot of things like that fear of failure and just like what it means about me and for me it's definitely grained in different aspects of upbringing and background but i mean it's definitely something everyone can relate to just like not feeling like they're performing well like whatever the consequence may be but yeah i think there's just something definitely to be said about um that aspect of performance you're talking about to sort of wrap things up uh i definitely want to say that i think i'm very impressed with how aware you are of everything that's happening with your internal monologue how all of the like internal systems that you have they're kind of talking to each other and how it makes you feel so um that awareness that literacy is definitely there i definitely see the maturity there so definitely again kudos kudos to you for all the hard work through all the different types of therapy that you've done um it definitely shows and obviously we definitely wish you the best to to, in your process to kind of find healing and i low-key would like to play an online edh game with you that would be great so yeah, let's um, do it. <laughs> yeah uh definitely wish we can get yeah keep the conversation get going deck too. <laughs> yeah it's, yeah, it's really simple one. man yeah. it's play Start lands get get resources invest in resources yeah yeah it's it's not that hard we'll teach we'll teach we'll ship you a I'll deck <laughs> as long as it's white and green i'll i'll take it <laughs> it's probably the best colors to start with in my opinion but that's just me <laughs> sure sure <laughs> <laughs> And we always like to end with a question before we hop off. What's one advice you would give to your younger self? Oh, God. Um, probably said this before or something. But you're okay. You're, you'll figure things out. There'll always be more things to figure out, but you're okay. And it's going to be okay. Yeah. Hey, Christian, thanks again for uh, your time, obviously sharing so openly and uh, just giving us, yeah, more insights to to, to your life. Uh, and I'm pretty sure a lot of people will definitely resonate with that. Yeah, no, thanks for creating the platform for sharing the stories. It's great stuff. Awesome. Yep. And so, yeah, if you love this episode, if you would want to give us a five-star review, we would definitely appreciate that on wherever you listen to your podcasts. And thanks again for tuning in to the Rama Brothers, and we will um, check check in with you next time.